Wow, I love that song and great rendition of that song too. Wow. What a beautiful morning it is out there, isn't it? At least it was when I was coming up from Boynton Beach and uh, just praise the Lord for nice south we- we- weather in Florida. And uh, so it's really a blessing. I uh, just wanted to say a few things before I get started. Uh, again, I said this last week at the Palms West Church and welcome Palms West Church to our broadcast today. And uh, <clears throat> thank you again for the condolences and love and cards, many cards I received from all the members, both at Palms West and uh, Jupiter Church, and uh, text messages and phone calls and things like that. So it's been very comforting. You know, we're all part of a family, parents, siblings, uh, then we get married and have children of our own. But you know, we're not only part of our immediate family, but we're part of a bigger family. And it's called the family of God. The body of Christ. Uh, by the way, in a, on the 13th, next time I'm here, uh, I'm going to have a sermon called The Body of Christ, The Family of God. And I'll share a little bit about my family, my mom, some memories of my mom. But also, Lord willing, there's uh, a few people I've invited here uh, from my community in Boynton Beach, Florida, Leisureville. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I don't want to. I don't want to get too sidetracked here, um, but but there's so much happening. It's it's hard to keep up with it all. But uh, I did meet a, a a couple. He's a retired pastor and his wife, and in the jacuzzi where I live. <laughs> you know, I had the golf course ministry. Now I got the jacuzzi ministry. You know, or the swimming pool ministry. They're right next to each other. But um, anyway, uh, I asked them there how they met Christ, became born again, and it's fascinating. Each one of them has a a unique uh, conversion story, so I've asked them to come and share. So Lord willing, they'll they'll come. And also, there was another woman uh, that was swimming around in the pool. Every time you go to the pool, there's someone swimming around or floating around. Hopefully, hopefully, (laughs) you know they're okay. But uh, (laughs) you never know. But uh, and 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 she said, "When is uh you know um, Greg and Debbie coming up to give their testimony?" I said. I think it's under 13. She goes, well, I want to come too. So, uh, so uh, I hope that you'll welcome them and, and, and treat them with the love you've shown me uh, as I come just a few months ago. All right, so let me put the cards down here, and uh, we're going to get started here in just a minute. My sermon title today is Rearview Mirror. Rearview Mirror. Um, you ever drive down the road? And you see something, let's say you're traveling somewhere, beautiful scenery or whatever, and you see something nice and you pass it by and then you say, wow, well, you know, that was neat. And you, when you drive by, you're kind of angling your head in the rearview mirror to see what you passed by. Have you ever done that? Yeah, I've done that on the way up here, a matter of fact. It was, it was, it was uncanny. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't a good thing. On the way up from, from uh, Boynton, I saw a minivan had hit the guardrail or something. And people were outside the van, and there was a guy in a pickup truck. He was on a cell phone because I was going to stop, but I knew there was help there, and the people looked like they were fairly okay. And so, but when I went by, I looked in the rearview mirror just to make sure. You know, so I'm sure you've done that. So, what we're going to do today, you know, I've been talking a lot about Bible prophecy, a lot of things. Last week I had a sermon about uh, living epistles. We talked about fasting. And, and I want to do a little review today on some of these things because in the next couple of weeks, uh, in the next month, I should say, I'm going to be going a little deeper into Bible prophecy. And I want to make sure that we have a, a clear foundational understanding of who we are as Seventh-day Adventists and what our mission to the world is. Can you say amen? amen. All right, so we're going to get into that. But first, you know, my custom is always to pray. So why don't we just bow our heads for a moment. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for another day of life. Thank you for a beautiful Sabbath day. Thank you that today, the day of rest, is just the icing on the cake of the rest we have every day in Jesus. So Lord, we do pray today, though, you still promise a special blessing on this day. So that's why we're here, because you've asked us to remember it. And we're remembering this day as we're remembering you. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us now. Give me the ability to speak, 
and to listen and all of us to listen to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Now, before I get started, <laughs> just a little bit more of a, a, a sidetrack here. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this store, right? All right. It, 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 maybe you don't want to admit it, but you are. I know you are. Come on. If I am, you are, right? You got to be. So, but the reason I want to share this is because um, I was volunteering at a local golf course in my community. I'm no longer there. I lost all my privileges. I had to, I had to leave. Uh, I was volunteering, but they forced, they were going to force me to receive a salary there and hire me. And I said, I can't do that. I, I'm a, I'm a, a pastor 24 7 I can't get an extra salary so I had to resign and um, so now I'm looking for another golf course <laughs> preferably up here in Jupiter to volunteer one day a week so Hans or anybody else up here if you got a golf course that needs a volunteer I'm available one day a week okay <laughs> but anyway this particular day I was going to the golf course to uh, to work and volunteer and when I got in there I ordered my usual should I tell you what I usually ordered you know, sometimes I tell people, and you know, anyway, can you handle it if I went to Dunkin' Donuts? All right, if you, if you saw me in Dunkin' Donuts, you wouldn't have a nervous breakdown, would you? I mean, but anyway, I went to Dunkin' Donuts, and I ordered my usual uh, two everything bagels with egg and cheese. All right, I, I already got some, some scared people here, you know, looking at me like, oh, egg and cheese. But anyway, and then I ordered my, uh, this will make you feel better, my medium decaf coffee with caramel swirl okay so there you go now you're going to feel better so when i get in there i ordered it like i usually do and uh all of a sudden this 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 little guy comes in there i don't want to get too new york here too new yorker here with my with my attitude but anyway he looked like a guy that i used many many new yorkers in new york they come in there you know and they just he comes to the front of the line and he orders something and all of a sudden five seconds later he Gets the guy behind the counter, hands him a bag, and he walks out. And I'm standing, I said, how did he order after me, and he got served before me? So I, I, there's a young man behind the counter, and I said, listen, did you give him my food? And he said, I gave it to Charles. I said, I'm Charles. <laughs> I said, you gave, my, you gave my two bagels, everything bagels with egg and cheese, to that little man who walked out of here. I was really getting my, my New York attitude up, you know what I mean, Elliot? And uh, anyway, be praying for me because I got a lot else to share here. But anyway, may have to have an intermission. But so anyway, I really and I said, you know, and he said, I can make another one. I said, I don't have time. You know, I had to get to the golf course. You know, what's more important than teeing off on time, right? So, so anyway, the guy comes back in, the little guy, <laughs> and he's opening up the bag and he has half a sandwich in his hand and he goes, this is not mine. I said. I, I grabbed it, and the guy, I said, thank you, everybody, and I took off. I went out the store, and I was worried, uh, this guy have COVID. I'm eating a sandwich that he touched, you know. So, <laughs> so anyway, uh, you know, immediately after that, I started thinking, you know, the Holy Spirit speaking to me. Pass the parson, Reese. Oh. <laughs> and then you start to justify it. Well, listen, I, you know, this, 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 but you know, we, as God's children, need to be a little bit better than the world, huh? And we need to react like Jesus would react. And I didn't act like, and you know, I went back there. Just to make a long story short, I went back there the next day. And the same people were behind the counter. There was a new guy, but there was a lady there and the same guy. Young, nice, good-looking young man who made the sandwiches. And I said, listen, I want to I wanna tell you all something. Uh, I said, I was in here the other day. You remember me? And I said, yeah, we remember you. <laughs> And I says, well, I want to apologize for reacting the way I did. It wasn't your fault. And, uh, and I said, I'm a pastor. And oh, their eyes opened up, you know. Like if I would have said, I didn't get a decaf coffee, your eyes would have opened up, you know. But, <laughs> but anyway, so I said, I want to apologize. I said, you know, God told me. I told this right to the young man's face. And, and, the, and the lady was listening. I said, God told me that I have no right to preach his word when I treated you like I treated you, so I want to ask you to forgive me, and I'm sorry. I said, you're a good man. You do a good job. And you know what? I said, I'm going to share this story in church to my congregation. And he, and he said, wow. You know, so, 
And, and so anyway, uh, I told him the, the website, and I don't know if he's watching or if he, uh, whatever. But anyway, so, you know, the thing of it is, all that I'm sharing, all that we do, let me just tell you something. All the Bible prophecy and all the knowledge that we have, it doesn't amount to a hill of beans if we don't share it in love and we don't have the spirit of Jesus. What do you say? Right? Arthur, Sonia, <laughs> they wanted me to do a little bit of review. So I'm going to do it real quick. Remember last week I preached about fasting in Isaiah 58? Just a quick review to clarify, okay? Here it is. Isaiah 58, verse 5. Is it a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast, an acceptable day to the Lord? And so God's saying, is this the fast that I've chosen? It was acceptable to me? He's asking that question. But look what he says now. Look. Is this not the fast that I have chosen? Okay, so this is the fast that God has chosen. To what? Loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry? You see, fasting in God's eyes is not so much, and I'm not discrediting this type of fasting, but... In God's eyes, it's not so much abstaining from bread, but it's sharing your bread with others, right? Isn't that what it says? And that you what? Bring to your house the poor who are cast out. When you see the naked, that you cover him and hide not yourself from your own flesh. Then your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth, uh, excuse me, spring forth speedily and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your real God. Then you should call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. Here am I. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, if you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall dawn, you, your, excuse me, then your light shall dawn in the darkness and your darkness shall be as the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones. You shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Those from among you shall build the old waste places. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations and you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. So here again, the fast which God counsels us to partake in and also reiterated here in second testimonies page 34 the fast which god can accept is described speaking of isaiah 58 is to deal thy bread to the hungry and to bring the poor which are cast out into thy house is that clear is that clear so although there is a time and a place for abstaining from food and we could talk about that, but I wanted to emphasize, at least in God's eyes, the fast that he's chosen for us. It's not so much, as I said, refraining from eating or abstaining from food, but it's sharing food with others. That's what the fast is really all about. And that should be the result of the fast, to help us to be more connected with people. Do it as a, as a formality. And, uh, you know, just something that we do occasionally and, and, and it's really no, no change in our lives or a change in the demeanor of the church. No, people who fast and pray, the result should be that they're more loving and they're more Christ-like. What do you say? Uh, quickly now, you remember in, was it Matthew, I believe, chapter nine, uh, 9, yes, in verse 14 and 15. Remember the disciples of John, they came to Jesus and they said what? Why do we and the Pharisee fa fast often, but your disciples do not fast? You see, the kind of fasting that the Pharisees used to do was kind of an outward show. And they used to disfigure their faces and walk around very solemn and, and woe is me, I'm without food for 24 hours or whatever it is. But look what Jesus said. He said, uh, can, can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The disciples were with Jesus. And, and not only that, but when you think about Isaiah's fast and Isaiah, the, the Isaiah fast and Isaiah 58, what was that all about? 
It was helping people, loving people, sharing your food with people, right? And, and so isn't that what Jesus did? What about in Matthew chapter 14? What happened in Matthew 14? Jesus gave food with two loaves, uh, excuse me, two fish and five loaves of bread, and he fed 5,000 men. That's excluding women and children because they didn't count them back then. So there were up to maybe 10, 12,000 people that ate that day because Jesus fed them. Now, let me ask you a question, and we're going to finish this review about fasting right now. Was Jesus and his disciples, according to Isaiah 58, were they fasting in Matthew 14 when they fed the 5,000? Yes, they were. Because Isaiah says, this is the fast that I have chosen. Uh, chosen. Share your bread with the hungry. So when, when disciples of John said, you're not fasting like we and the Pharisees fast, were they, was that true? No, it wasn't true. Because they were doing the Isaiah 58 fast by sharing the bre their bread with the hungry. So you see, we need to understand uh, that, that, that and, and let me just say this. Truth never conflicts. It always complements. Did you hear me? So there's more than one way of looking at something and bringing out the, the truth of something for us to learn. And that's all I'm doing right here. I want you to understand that there is a time and place for abstaining from food and fasting and prayer. We know that. It's biblical. But this is something that many people I find in my experience as a pastor uh, don't quite understand. And so that's why I wanted to bring it out. So now you know. When you help people, you could be fasting just as much as when you don't eat any food. Amen? Or when you share your food with somebody. All right. All right. We, uh, so they, are, they were fasting that day. Even though they were eating fish and bread, they were, according to Isaiah 58, they were fasting. So let's do a little more of that type of fasting, right? Because that's the, the fast that God has chosen for us. All right. Let's move on now. Woo, I said a lot already. So it's, it's helping people. It's loving people. And this is what Isaiah says is really true fasting. All right. Now, we've got to move on here. If I can just get to the next slide. Here we go. <clears throat> All right. This is going to be a review of the prophecy sermons I've been preaching for the past few weeks or months. Remember, a few weeks back, I preached a sermon called Signs of the Times. And that was based on Matthew 24, Luke 21, when Jesus' the disciples asked him, what would be the sign of his coming in the end of the world? Remember that. Now, Jesus said there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. He also went on and gave a little more detail. He said there's going to be signs in what? The sun, the moon, and the stars. Very interesting. The astronomical, astronomical phenomena will be seen in the last days in the sun and the moon and the stars, Jesus said. Now, so what specifically was Jesus referring to when he mentioned the sun, moon, and the stars? Is it possible for us to know uh, when these things would take place? Or have they taken place already? And re Jesus gave us a key indicator. Remember that, a key indicator. He said what? Immediately after the tribulation of those days. Okay, that's the key indicator. Then the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven. So remember that key indicator, that key phrase, immediately after the tribulation, these signs would appear so we can know when his coming is near and the end of the world is near. Back in the Old Testament, if you remember uh, the presentation I gave, I referred to the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 31. It says, The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So here again, it, remember, it mentions uh, certain things that would take place in regards to the moon and the sun. In the book of Revelation, chapter 6, it tells us, verses 12 and 13, Beheld, when he had opened the sixth seal, lo, there was a great earthquake. Jesus mentioned earthquakes as one of the signs of the end. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree cast her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wing, a wind. 
So, Joel, Matthew 24, Luke 21, Revelation chapter 26, uh, chapter 6, excuse me. They all talk about these signs that Jesus said would take place immediately after a time of tribulation that would happen right before he returns the second time. Now, how did Jesus know this? Well, of course, you know the text, Isaiah 46, verse 9 and 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no, not another. I am God, and there is none like me. What was that phrase, Marie, you shared in Sabbath school today about God? Remember that? What was that, what was that word again you looked up in the dictionary? What's that? Non-contingent, right? Non -con it means you're not connected to anything else. You're not dependent on anybody else for life or for, for, for breath or for sustenance. You, 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 you exist in and of yourself, and that's the way God is. He's a non-contingent being, the only one in the universe. So that's what it said. There's none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from what? From ancient time, the things that are not yet done. So that's, Jesus knew what would take place in the future because he's the non-contingent one, the being that, that knows all things yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So, so, so Jesus, looking down time, knew that these things would take place before he comes. And what was he referring to when he said immediately after the tribulation? All right. Now, we want to go to Daniel 2. I know, see, we're kind of putting pieces of a puzzle together. And you may have to watch this later on today, a second time. But if you've been following along, you're kind of understanding where I'm going with this. Remember Daniel chapter 2. Remember King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. Remember he had a dream and Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember they interpreted that dream for him. And he had this dream of a large metallic statue and a stone that hit the statue on its feet and ground it to powder. You can read about it in Daniel 2. And remember, these different metals, Daniel told King Nebuchadnezzar, represented the different nations that would rule the world after Babylon's time. Head of gold, Babylon. Arms and chest of silver represented Medo-Persia. Belly and thighs of brass represented the kingdom of Greece with Alexander the Great. And then the legs of iron represented the fourth kingdom that would rule the world and that was Rome. Now, Daniel 2.40 says, The fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. We know that the kingdom of Rome ruled the world from 168 B.C. to the year 70, 1798 A.D. for almost two centuries. Now, initially, the Roman Empire persecuted God's people. Time of tribulation, like Jesus talked about. With the beheading of John the Baptist by Herod, and then the crucifixion of Jesus himself under the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, and then the beheading of Paul and the crucifixion of the apostle Peter under the emperor Nero. But that was nothing in comparison to what took place under the Holy Roman Empire. Roman Empire with the Caesars persecuted God's people, but also the Holy Roman Empire, the church itself, if you can believe it, persecuted God's people and put to death millions of them. Millions of them. Now, you may say, oh, Pastor Parson Reed, you know, that's kind of a knock against the church. You know, we shouldn't be criticizing. I'm just bringing out the historical evidence and information for your benefit so we can understand. Now, if you don't want to take my word for it, remember, you, whose word can you take for it? How about the head of the Catholic Church? This is a New York Times article from March 13, 2000. The headline was, Pope asked forgiveness for errors of the church over 2,000 years. Over 2,000 years. And look what it says here. Saying we humbly ask forgiveness, John Paul II today delivered the most sweeping papal apology ever, repenting for the errors of his church over the last 2,000 years. And look what he said here, I'm quoting, we cannot, we cannot not recognize the betrayal of the gospel committed by some of our brothers, look at what he says here now, especially during the second millennium. You're following along, church. So, so the Pope himself, John Paul II, he acknowledged that the church had caused tribulation and persecution against 
other, other people, God's people. And while they claim themselves to be God's people, but he specifically, specifically zeroed in on the second millennium. That's after the year 1000 AD and even later on into that century, or that, that millennium, I should say. Now, this is an article from Ministry Magazine in June of 1979. This is what it says. French forces reached the outskirts of Rome on February 9, 1798. Six days later, they occupied the city itself without opposition. On February 20th, Pius VI, Got my Roman numerals right there, right, Arthur? <laughs> All right, if I, if I need help with juniper tree again, I'm going to ask you. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Our Pius VI was carried into exile at the hands of the French. Sign look what it says here. Signaling the end of the long period of papal dominance in Europe, European affairs. So around the mid-1700s, this time of tribulation that God's people were suffering for almost 2,000 years, and even was most severely in the second millennium, was now coming to an end. And Jesus knew that because he could see the future. He could see world events. He could see who the major players and, 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 and would participate in persecuting his people. And that's what he was telling his disciples way back there in Matthew 24 and Luke 21. So we were to look, he said, for these signs to take place after that time of tribulation of the church of his people and we know as I covered the first of those signs took place the great Lisbon earthquake on November 1st 1755 after the tribulation had beginning to subside in the mid 1700s wasn't totally gone yet but it had subsided they were no longer burning people at the stakes they were no longer beheading people no longer uh, throwing people in prison for their whole lives. Now it started to subside. And these are when the signs took place. And also the second one, May 19, 1780, the great dark day, when in New England, that day the sun came up, and then it became as dark as night. And that same night, the moon came up blood red, just like it says in the book of Joel. And it also, we know the third of those signs that Jesus spoke about took place on November 13th, 1833, the falling of the stars over large parts of, of, of New England and the United States. Now, you may be asking, and, and here I want to get to this because we need to understand this. You may be, well, Pastor Parson, are you saying that some phenomena like this about the sun, moon, and the stars that, you know, people saw in New England and maybe some parts of Europe, uh, it, it was the signs Jesus talked about? What's such the big deal about New England? Well, I'm going to tell you what the big deal about New England was. Remember Thanksgiving time in November, I preached a sermon called The United States and Bible Prophecy. Remember that? And remember I talked about the text in Revelation chapter 12, verse 14. It says, And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Now, I don't have time to review this. You go back and watch that sermon and if you need to fill in the blanks. The serpent we know is who? The devil, the same serpent that deceived Eve in the Garden of Eden, right? And the water, we realized, were, were nations and peoples that the devil used to persecute the woman who was, a who was the church. That's the woman, the church. We learned all of that. So here we have the serpent has a group of people that's going to persecute God's church so that she would be carried away by this flood of people who were persecuting her. And look what the Bible says. What does it say? The earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Lord have mercy. You keep praying for me because i got to bring this to a close. And, and God's Holy Spirit's going to help me to do that and help us to all understand. So here we go. How did the earth help the woman? <laughs> we just told you over in Italy, over in Europe. Over in the Middle East with the Crusades and the, and, and, and the Inquisitions and things like that, God's people were being hounded and persecuted and put to death. And they had to flee to the mountains to worship him. And, but God opened up a way that when Satan, the serpent, cast that flood of waters, those persecutors after his church, God opened up a way for the people of Europe to come to a, a land where freedom reigns. Can you say amen? And, and these people, 
How did the earth suck up this flood of water? It put an ocean between the two continents. Can you say amen? You see, this is how God provided for his people. And they came here, the pilgrims. And at first in, in Jamestown in 1607, Jamestown, Virginia, and then in Plymouth, Massachusetts in 1620. And when they got here, they knelt and they thanked God for freedom and, and, and for a break in the persecution that they were suffering over in Europe. And they developed a nation without a king and a church without a pope. They had enough of that over there. And now they came to the shores of America and they established a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, can you say amen? You see, this is how the earth helped the woman, his church, by swallowing up that persecution in that big Atlantic Ocean and, us to, and God's people to establish colonies here on the shores of America. See, this is the land that helped the church. And look what it says from the book Maranatha, from the spirit of prophecy. The Lord has done more for the United States than for any other country upon which the sun shines. Is that a profound statement? Why did he do more? Because this was the land that helped the woman that swallowed up the flood. Here he provided an asylum for his people where they could worship him according to the dictates of conscience. Here Christianity has progressed in its purity. The life-giving doctrine of the one mediator between God and man has been freely taught. Couldn't do that over there in Europe. God designed that this country should ever remain free for all people to worship him accordance with the dictates of conscience. He designed that its civil institutions in their expanse productions should represent the freedom of the gospel privileges. Can you say amen? Yes, Jesus said immediately after the tribulation. And see, the significance of, of this land that helped the woman, this is where God chose to have these signs take place because this is where his people came. His true followers came wanting to serve him in freedom and in truth. And these were the signs took place in the earthquake, the sun, the moon, and the stars. Started in Europe, but when his people came to America, now the signs were seen in America as well. You see, this is the thing that Daniel talked about in Daniel chapter 2. You see, after Rome, after the fall of Rome, of the Roman Empire, both secular and religious Rome after the legs of iron we are now living in the times of the feet of the statue of Daniel 2 and the feet of part iron and part clay there's no more nation to rule the world there's no more one world government that will not now dominate and rule the affairs of men we are living in a time where some weak nations and some strong nations abide and it will remain like that until Jesus comes soon Jesus will come and hit that statue on those clay and iron feet and ground that whole statue into powder and then he will set up his kingdom which will be an everlasting kingdom that will have no end. Acts 4 verse 10 and 11 says, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom God raised from the dead. This is the what, church? This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become what? The chief cornerstone. And it also tells us here, moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, all drank of the same, same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock, and that rock that followed him was who? Was Jesus Christ. Can you say Amen. You see, he's the stone in Daniel 2. He's the rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. He is the rock that will come to set up his kingdom. And we're living in that time now. Amen. Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar that the dream is certain and the interpretation is sure. Amen. You see, members of the Jupiter Church and of the Palms West, I almost said Pompano. But they, if they want to watch, some of them are watching. They can watch too. <laughs> See, it's not the messenger, brothers and sisters, but it's the message we have. The marvelous light that God has called us into. You see, it's almost time for the Lord to come. The signs have all taken place. We're just now waiting for Jesus to come. And, you know, I've talked to a few people. 
And, and, and they use the phrase, things are getting hot. Things are heating up. Not only in the world, but, but in our witness experiences. Every day I go to the jacuzzi. <laughs> Every day I go to the pool. It's someone else. I just tell you this one thing, and I'm gonna, we're going to have prayer. I went to the pool the other night, and there was a couple that came in. It was, the pool closes at 8 o'clock, about 7.30. And we got, I always wind up getting to talking, and I always get to telling people I'm a, I'm a pastor. And always, in the, I don't volunteer, but most of the time I let them ask. They go, well, where is your church? And I said, I'm a pastor of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Jupiter in Loxahatchee. And the guy's reaction was like, I mean, his, 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 chase, his face changed, and he goes, I said, I, said, I could tell by the reaction, you've had some uh, experience with uh, encounters with Seventh-day Adventists before, and he says, I have. He goes, my 89-year-old father, when my mom died, he remarried a woman when he was in his 70s, and she was a Seventh-day Adventist, and he is a member uh, in the church up in Zeph Zephyr Hills, Florida. He's 89 years old, and every Sunday, he helps with the food sharing pro program that they have up there. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. You know, here I, here I, I and, and I'm wondering, well, I, I didn't, and he says, and you know another thing, he said, Let, we're going to go out and play some golf together and talk more. You see? You see, that's what it's all about. That's, that's it's things that he, the Holy Spirit is working on people's hearts because Jesus is coming soon. You see, Sometimes we wonder, oh, I, 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 you know, and I've said this before. Sometimes it's not we don't have to witness. We are a witness. And if we have the light of Jesus in our hearts, in our expression, in our face, and the light of Jesus in our eyes, people will notice it, and God will work upon their hearts, and they will open up. We will just have to be there to share with them. What do you say? That's all. We don't have to bang our heads against a blackboard trying to figure out like, like, the, like the teachers used to hit <laughs> back when I was in school. No, we, we just have to let Jesus live in us and God will use us to his honor and glory. What do you say? Amen. Romans 13, 11 and 12 as we close. And do this, knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. What do you say? Amen. In the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking into further prophetic books. Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 8. Revelation chapter 14. And I wanted to build that foundation. So we need to know who we are, why we're all here together on this day. Because we're Seventh-day Adventists and we have a message to tell the world. What do you say? Let us pray. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, you've called us out of darkness into this marvelous light of this Advent message. And it's not our message. It's your message. It's your message to the world, to every nation, kindred, and tongue, and people. You're asking the world to repent, to turn from their ways and turn towards you. Lord, there's nothing in the world, there's nothing that old devil, that serpent has to offer us. It may be exciting, it may be thrilling, but it's only sweet for a season. And then it ends in death and despair. Lord, we choose you today. We give our hearts to you again today. And those who are watching online over at Palms West, or those of us here who are physically in this church in Jupiter here, if you choose Jesus today, just raise your hand and tell Jesus, tell God, I choose you today. Use me, dear Lord. Even though we're a people of unclean lips, touch our lips from an altar on high with that coal and cleanse us from our sins and let the light of the gospel, the light of the love of God, the light of the love of Jesus shine through us to the world and all we come in contact with. Bless us now, dear Lord, and as we go our separate ways, until we meet again, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.